want to lose any time. The next item of business is a debate on motion 11290 in the name of Andy Whiteman on scrap the council tax. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. I call on Andy Whiteman to speak and move the motion. Mr Whiteman, nine minutes please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The last time Parliament had a debate on the future of local tax was in September 2016, uh, when rather typically in such debates we ended up not agreeing to anything. Um, had Douglas Ross, uh, former of this place, not been in Switzerland at a football training camp, however, Parliament would have agreed by a majority to have further discussions. And all MSPs did, in fact, vote for amendments that committed them to that. Today we have further amendments from the government saying that it is open to further dialogue on options for local tax reform. Now, I don't have any problem sitting down to discuss local tax options, except that is precisely what I did, and indeed Jackie Bailey did, in the Commission on Local Tax Reform. And our final report, published in December 2015, contained 19 recommendations, the first of which was expressed in unambiguous terms, and I quote, the present council tax system must end. Our concluding two recommendations noted that with the goodwill that had been established between Labour, Greens, Liberal Democrats and the SNP, the time for local tax reform had come and it concluded that this was an opportunity that must not be missed. Since September 2016, no substantive discussions have taken place. And for such discussions to be meaningful, they have to have a clear focus. And that focus needs to be a commitment to scrap the council tax and all of its associated flaws. And if we can't agree on that, then we're failing to live up to our responsibilities. Happy? I'm grateful to Mr Whiteman for giving way. Um, I think many of us uh, would keep the council tax in the absence of any better alternative. We cannot resolve to scrap it unless we know what we're proposing to replace it. So what is the green proposal? Is it a garden tax or what is it? Andy Whiteman. That we, this debate has been bedeviled by people claiming that we have to keep this out-of-date, archaic, regressive tax because we can't agree on what should replace it. In order to, to get rid of that logjam, we should agree to get rid of it. Sit down, have an implementation group, as our motion suggests, and come up with an agreed uh, 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 future uh, system. So, at the budget this year, that's why my colleague Patrick Harvey made clear that Scottish Greens would be unable to enter budget negotiations for 2019-20 unless meaningful progress has been made on local tax reform. And he wrote to the First Minister outlining some short, middle and long-term options and making clear that negotiation between the parties would be necessary for such progress uh, to happen. And in her, in her response earlier this month, the First Minister noted a range of initiatives underway, including the government's own tinkering with the council tax, uh, the planning bill, the Scottish Land Commission, etc. In other words, let's kick this can further down the road. Let's ignore the commission established by her in February 2015. Let's wait for more reports, reviews and debate. Presiding officer, Greens are not prepared to wait any longer. We want to see action. And that includes as a bare minimum an unequivocal agreement to scrap the council tax. It's a fundamentally bad tax and I'm disappointed the government continues to believe that some minor tinkering will make the meaningful changes that are needed. And particularly I reject the First Minister's claim that changes to the council tax have, and I quote, tackled the fundamental regressiveness of the system. I reject also Derek Mackay's claims in his amendment that the changes made in 2016 make the council tax, and I quote, more progressive. In fact, they make it marginally less regressive, but that's a long way short of being progressive in any way. And for the record, taxes can be regressive, proportionate, or progressive. Regressive taxes are those where the lower the value of the tax base, the higher the tax rate. That's the council tax. Proportionate taxes are where everyone pays the same rate, for example, 1%. Progressive taxes are where the higher the value of the tax base, the higher the tax rate, as we have in income tax. And the Commission's report clearly showed that council tax was and remains one of the most regressive taxes in the UK in relation to the value of the property and indeed in relation to income as well. And the changes made in 2016 do not change that fact. And if we need reminding, the Resolution Foundation published a report last week and it observed that someone living in a property worth £100,000 has around five times the effective tax rate of someone living in a property worth a million and it articulated the four broad reasons why that is the case. Firstly, 
that the very wide bands mean that properties with widely varying values pay the same tax. Secondly, that the fixed multiplier of tax rates between the bands, uh, it, where the ratio is far, far less than the ratio of the tax base. Third, that the property values are over a quarter of a century out of date. And fourth, because of the huge regional variation, with band D properties in Edinburgh being far more valuable, for example, than band D properties in Inverclyde. Now, the Resolution Foundation go on to argue that because of the gross regressivity of the council tax, it now looks increasingly like the pull tax that it replaced. And its failings hit the youngest households worse as they live increasingly in the lowest banded properties. Presenting officer Naomi Eisenstadt, the First Minister's advisor on poverty and inequality, urged ministers in her first report to, and I quote, be bold on local tax reform. She went on to say, and I quote, this is a central moment of political decision, an opportunity to introduce a much more progressive system, one that will have important implications, particularly for working households at or just above the poverty line. Now that moment of political decision was ducked. But this moment, three years out from the next Holyrood election, can still be that moment. We have the time to begin a process of fundamental reform, to transition to a fair, a modern, a transparent and a flexible system. And instead, the Finance Secretary and his colleagues routinely turn up in this chamber and in committee and tell us that progressivity lies at the heart of their tax plans. With respect to council tax, it so clearly does not. Now, I understand, as Murdo Fraser observed a few moments ago, that some take the view that in the absence of agreement on a replacement, we should not scrap the council tax yet. But if not now, then when? A succession of reports, analyses and inquiries have all said quite clearly that this iniquitous, regressive and archaic tax has had its day. The Lyons inquiry said scrap it. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says scrap it. The Commission on Local Tax Reform, end it. The OECD is clear, it is regressive and outdated. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the Adam Smith Institute both said get rid of it. So why then are we not at the very least able to agree that notwithstanding various views on its replacement, that the council tax must go. Presiding officer, Scottish Greens bring this debate to Parliament today to make clear that the status quo is no longer tenable. We're focused on the council tax as a start, but the system of local government finance as a whole is not fit for purpose. Not only do we need a new system of local tax, we need to give far greater fiscal autonomy to councils and to adopt and agree a fiscal framework to replace the annual arguments about the local government settlement. And just as the Scottish Parliament is maturing as an institution with new responsibilities for raising public finances, so too should local government be accorded the same status and the same fiscal freedom that is the norm right across countries uh, in Europe. Presiding officer, with constituents of mine who are living in banned E properties, which are worth less the nearby properties in ban B, and where the majority of taxpayers are paying the wrong amount of tax, what conceivable justification can there be for us all to do anything other than commit to scrapping the council tax? And our ongoing inability to deal with this issue should shame this parliament. If today we're unsuccessful in persuading members to back our call, so be it. But hear this. Scottish Greens are a party of radical democracy. We believe in the capacity of the local state to organize its own affairs, be responsible for its own finances, and to be accountable to the electorate it serves. And that is why in the next few weeks, I will be launching a consultation on a draft member's bill to incorporate the European Charter of Local Self-Government into Scots law. That will have implications for what we're debating today. Now, if we, agree, if we reach no agreement on fundamental reform, there will be no budget negotiations by my party at the end of this year. We reject the idea that we can go on any longer with business as usual. Presiding officer, I move motion 11290 in my name. Thank you very much. I call on Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and move amendment 1129.2. Six minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, the package of reforms to council tax set out in our 2016 Scottish Parliament manifesto has been by, uh, delivered by the Scottish Government with the structural changes in place since April 2017. 
and as a consequence, council tax is now fairer. As this debate is essentially about local government funding, I would, of course, restate my view that local government has a fair settlement from the Scottish Government. The Commission on Local Tax Reform highlighted that one of the iniquities of the original council tax system was that the higher value properties incurred a smaller amount of tax relative to their value than those in the lower value bands. So we address that by changing the way council tax is calculated for properties in bands E, F, G and H. These reforms, yes I will. Andy Whiteman. I, I recognise the reforms that were made in 2016, but I, I don't agree with the Minister that they address the fundamental inequity and regressiveness of the council tax, and they don't address the criticism that the Commission on Local Tax Reform made that the tax rate for those at the top was less than the tax rate for those at the bottom. That still is the case. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Andy Whiteman has referred to it as tinkering, it raises over £500 million for public services retained locally. I wouldn't describe that as tinkering. I think that's a substantial investment in Scotland's public services. And that's before we even get to the matter of locally determined uh, increases. And in terms of the Resolution Foundation that was quoted, I'm very mindful that they said, in terms of the SNP's proposition going into the Scottish Parliament elections, that the SNP's tax increase would raise revenue in a progressive manner, with the tax rise falling harder on higher income households. That's what the Resolution Foundation said at the time. And in relation, if, if I could make progress, I think I only have five minutes and I've taken one intervention. I do have a lot to say in terms of the government's position. There was also a fair judgment around political parties will attach a different weights to the considerations that were set out in the Commission on Local Tax a reform. But the Commission, as I say on local tax reform, highlighted the need for relief to be available for low income households. And a council tax reduction scheme provides exactly that, and the reforms enhanced it, especially for households with children, where we have an increase in the child allowance by 25% and continue to refuse to follow the UK government's damaging example of applying a two child cap. Now, when local taxation was last debated, I was clear that we were on a journey of reform, and these were just the first steps, and I was clear that I was willing to engage. The members are well aware we've made reforms, say, through the Barclay review of the non-domestic rate system, and we are interesting in engaging further in the council tax, but we have been determined to strike the right balance between protecting household incomes and ensuring that our public services have the resources they need to deliver. Now, believe our decisions on tax and the allocation of resources achieve that balance. This is why we set out in our 2016 manifesto that the time was right after nine years to lift the council tax freeze, but the increases would be capped at 3%, not 5.99%, as currently applies in England. And I believe that that does strike the right balance. All councils have now set their council tax rate for the forthcoming financial year, and all have raised the council tax by 3% which will mean a further £77 million for local services. Without some sort of constraint, taxpayers risk increases like the 12.5% increase the Labour Minority and Administration in North Ayrshire was proposing for 2018-19. Where we have asked households to pay more tax, we have done so in a reasonable and balanced way. We continue to be committed to making local taxation fairer and ensuring that tax overall is progressive, and we continue to be open to discuss how that might be achieved. The opposition parties may be able to provide a critique of the government's position or the existing council tax regime, but there is no majority view on a replacement. And in keeping with our collaborative approach on taxation, this debate and proposals for further reform need serious engagement and not cheap political points. I believe the discussion paper, I've got, about, I've got very little time left, I believe that the discussion paper on the role of income tax in Scotland and the consultation throughout was an exemplar in engagement on tax. Even if the opposition disagreed with the final policy outcomes, the process was one of consultation and sound methodology with clear tests established. There is no clear alternative proposition to the council tax, which commands a majority in this parliament. Therefore, an implementation forum seems somewhat presumptive. For our part, 
We have tasked the Land Commission to explore the possibility of introducing a land value tax to ensure that we can take that forward, uh, an informed decision on that uh, as an area where there's much interest but limited examples of it in operation. The local government's role in this dialogue is absolutely fundamental. They would have to implement any changes and depend on the decisions that we make, depend on the revenues collected, or potentially have to deal with any shortfall should the reforms be ill-considered. So changes to local tax must be progressed in partnership with local government with a clear evidence base. In that regard, the Commission on Local Tax Reform did do valuable work. But our governance review builds on this as we work with COSLA to engage the public and look across all of our public services in order to understand the changes that can improve lives and bring democracy closer to the people. So for all of those reasons, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I must warn members there is absolutely no time in hand, so speeches must be kept to time and absorb any interventions. Yes, it's bad timing for you. Uh, I now call Mr. Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 11290.2.1. Mr. Fraser, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Green Party for bringing this debate, and at least they are consistent in their messages on local taxation. But I think we have already exposed in this short debate the black hole at the centre of the Green Party's argument, because we cannot resolve to scrap the council tax without agreeing what we're going to replace it with. And I listened very carefully to uh, Andy Whiteman's opening speech, and I'm no clearer as to what the Greens are proposing as an alternative. I've heard them talk previously about a garden tax. I must say that surprised me. I thought the Greens would be in favour of gardens where they can cultivate their homegrown vegetables, their turnips and their marrows, and now it seems they want to tax these self-same gardens. But we're not any clearer about what they're proposing. I'm sorry, I've only got four minutes. Do you have a chance to respond winding up, Mr Whiteman? Now, those of us with long memories uh, will recall in 2007, the SNP were elected on a clear manifesto commitment to scrap the council tax and replace it with a local income tax. Indeed, the language used by SNP politicians at that time about the council tax was near hysterical, talking about the unfair council tax or even the, the hated council tax. Of course, once they were in office, even with an overall majority, they took no steps to scrap the council tax, despite all their promises and despite the fact it was supposedly hated. Back in 2005, as Andy Whiteman has said, the Scottish Government's Commission on Local Taxation uh, reported, and it said the council tax must go. But just like the Greens today, they couldn't actually come up with an alternative proposal. Fortunately, the Scottish Conservatives were there to help out, not for the first time. Uh, we established our own independent commission for competitive and fair taxation in Scotland, which reported just a month later, in January 2016. And this recommended that the council tax structure should remain essentially unchanged, but with an increase on the multiplier on the higher bands of G&H. And as it happened, the SNP government rejected the recommendations of their own commission on local taxation and adopted proposals very similar to those proposed by our commission, although they went further in increasing the multiplier on bands E and F in addition, and increased those on G and H higher than we would otherwise have gone. So that's where we are. We already have had reform of the council tax, and we do not support further reform of the council tax, and accordingly we reject the green motion today. The council tax is by no means perfect. No system of taxation is, but it is better than many of the alternatives. The council tax is long established, is easily understood, it's relatively efficient and it's relatively easy to collect. It is a property tax and therefore an approximation of a tax on wealth, which is appropriate at a time when we regularly express our concern about the bias in our tax system towards taxes on income as opposed to taxes on wealth. And while property may not always be an accurate proxy for wealth, nevertheless it is our view that some sort of property tax should be a component in the overall taxation mix here in Scotland, as it is in most other, other Western countries. What we would support, I'm sorry, I just don't have time, Mr. Whiteman. What we would support, presiding officer, is broadening the range of taxes that the councils have at, at their disposal, and we want to see that underpinned by a new fiscal framework between Scottish Government and local authorities, and Mr. Whiteman would say. So that's looking, for example, at devolving lands and buildings transaction tax uh, to councils and looking at more control over business rates. Let me just say, in closing, uh, presiding officer, there's one more important point to be made, which is covered in my amendment today. Because when we hear parties on the left 
like the Greens, talking about tax reform, often that is code for higher taxation. And already the overall income tax burden in Scotland is higher than the rest of the United Kingdom. We do not want to see discussions around tax reform being used as a Trojan horse for yet more taxes on hard-pressed Scottish families at a time when our economy is faltering. So, presiding officer, we reject green plans to scrap the council tax without any idea as to what is to replace it. We do support plans to give councils additional taxation powers, and we oppose plans for overall increases and in taxation. Your amendment, and I move now. the amendment Thank you. in my name. Thank you. Thank you. I call James Kelly to speak to move amendment number 11290.1. Mr Kelly, five minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank Andy Whiteman and the Greens for bringing forward this important debate today uh, and move the amendment in my name? Because it is time to scrap the council tax. These are not my words, Deputy Presiding Officer. These are the words of Nicola Sturgeon on the 11th of April 2007. Indeed, 11 years uh, ago just now, the, the country was adorned with posters like this one, uh, where the SNP Now you know how I feel about props. Scrap, I, right, right, put it down. Scrap put it, the no, unfair put it council down. tax. Put it the, down. It's an important, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's a very important piece of evidence because it shows Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond pledging to scrap the unfair council tax 11 years ago just now. And the reality is, the reality is that 11 years, not, not just now, the reality is that 11 years down the road, uh, we, we have Alex Salmond, no, not just now, we have Alex Salmond as a discredited uh, television host and we still have the discredited council tax in place. So how can we trust the SNP on uh, local taxation? The changes that they put forward in 2016 uh, merely tinkered around the evidence, uh, sorry, tinkered around the edges. In evidence to the local government committee, Professor David Bell said they didn't address the concerns raised by the Commission for Local Tax Reform. Uh, Kenneth Gibb of Policy Scotland described them as a policy fudge. And essentially, they didn't uh, address the inherent unfairness that people see in local communities and local MSPs see themselves as they, they raised as frequently there are cases raised with us about the unfairness uh, of the council tax. Uh, Labour at the 2016 uh, Scottish elections put forward a proposal to abolish the council tax and replace it with a fairer system of property tax uh, which was based on uh, modelling prepared for the Commission on Local Tax Reform. And that demonstrated that 2 million households, 80% of all households, would be better off. Surely a much uh, fairer system. In addition to that, it's not just about a replacement for the council tax. It's about how we shift the balance of power and responsibility and re-empower uh, local government. From that point of view, we have put forward in recent times proposals for a tourist tax. This is something that's used in uh, countries around the world. It's used in France, it's used in Barcelona. Uh, in this city of Edinburgh, there are hundreds of thousands of visitors from overseas, particularly uh, during the festival period. And it makes good economic sense uh, to have a tourist tax in place. And to, yeah, I'll take the intervention. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, does James Kelly uh, agree with me that? Um, oh, just sorry. Does James Kelly agree with me that um, having a tourism tax would actually um, have an impact on our domestic travellers? So, 84% of um, travellers to Scotland are domestic travellers. James Kelly. I think the reality is, if you look at the international examples, it works fine uh, in countries like France and Barcelona and, Cat and, and also in regions like Catalonia. Uh, and it's got economic benefits there. And I would argue it would have economic benefits uh, in Scotland. And that allied uh, to the use of a land value tax, which is gaining traction even in SNP circles. Alec Neil recently wrote an article in the Airdrie and Coatbridge Advertiser, uh, you know, putting forward support for a land value tax uh, and also a social responsibility uh, levy on alcohol sales. All these mechanisms would raise additional revenue for uh, local councils, but crucially, what they would do 
is they would also move more powers to local councils because recently it's become too centralised and local government has been penalised uh, by the SNP government here. So this gives an opportunity for more, more revenue raising powers to be in the hands of local councils. From that point of view, we very much welcome uh, the Greens motion today and the suggestion of cross-party talks to tackle this issue and to try and come up with constructive solutions. And summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is time up for the council tax and it's time for this inept SNP government to, to build a proper democratic solution that delivers for local people. Thank you very much. I move to the open debate. Speeches of a tight four minutes. John Mason, followed by Bill Bowman, who has three minutes. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think it's good that we're having a wide-ranging debate today with the chance, I think, to brainstorm and float uh, a few different ideas. I mean, I think, as others have said, there, there is a lot of agreement that council tax is not ideal. And probably most of us are agreed that we would ideally like to get rid of it. And I consider it was good that it was frozen for a number of years, eh, but now has been reformed a bit and allowed to rise. Now, one problem with council tax has been that it is based on 1991 values, and any revaluation now is likely to lead to significant winners and losers. If some properties have risen relatively less in value since 1991, and that probably would apply to poorer areas, including in my constituency, they would win as their relative value within Glasgow has fallen. But I accept that in the West End, with property values rising more, the owners there might take a significant hit. If it's quick again. Thank John you, Finney. Yes, I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Does the member recall when him and I used to campaign for the abolition of council tax? He talked about reform. Perhaps he could let us know the, the point where he stopped wanting the abolition of council tax. John Mason. I, I'm going on to that. I mean, basically, to give him a quick answer, I would support the abolition of council tax if we can get something better that's agreed on. And we need to have that agreement from at least uh, two parties as to what any replacement should be. But I really feel that this is so fundamental to how Scotland works, and there will be significant upheaval costs, as Derek Mackay rightly outlined, that I would certainly be keen that any new system has widespread party support and widespread public support and buy-in so that most of us can support it and it will stay in place for a good length of time. We cannot be changing the system of local government finance very often. Now, there are certain principles I hope we can agree on concerning local taxation. For example, it should be linked to the ability to pay. Local government should raise more of its own money so that, like the Scottish Parliament, what is raised and what is spent would be more closely matched. And there will always need to be some transfer of resources between richer and poorer areas. That would presumably be based on need, for example, island costs being higher, eh, or there's more poverty in Glasgow or in Verclyde. However, that leaves open certain other questions, which I think as yet we are not agreed on. Should every council have the same range of taxes or choose from a palette of possible taxes? For example, some want a tourist tax, some do not. Is it possible to get one system that suits Glasgow and Clackmannanshire? or is some asymmetric system possible? Now, the SNP certainly has been keen on local income tax, and it still has strong arguments in its favour, not least the link to ability to pay. How, no, no, I'm sorry, I just don't have time. Uh, however, also some difficulties with it. Practically, could we have 32 different rates of income tax, and would HMRC either be willing or able to manage that? Conceptually, would we actually abolish the property tax? And I have some sympathy with the arguments that Murdo Fraser put forward, eh, because it is easy to understand, it's much harder to avoid. Now, land valuation tax has been popular, I know, with the Greens, and I'm not sure if that's still their first choice. And I've had it explained to me more than once, and I have felt I was beginning to understand it, but I have to admit, I do not think LVT is easy to grasp, and we need to have a tax that public really feels comfortable with. I think the previous commission that Marco Biaggi set up did raise some problems with LVT as well, so that areas like in my constituency, like Bayliston, which is not well off, but people have very large gardens as ex-council housing, it would end up paying more, perhaps. Now, it's been suggested in the media that the Greens would like a property tax based on current valuation, and I just wonder how that would work in practice if they would expect properties to be valued every single year. So overall, I think the government is open to discussion, and I personally support exploration of the options. However, I would like to see broad agreement in the chamber and in the public as to the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. I call Bill Bowman. Point of order, Rachel Hamilton.
Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I asked an intervention to James Kelly um, as my role in sh as Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Culture and Tourism. However, in my haste, I um, failed to declare an interest. Thank you. Thank you. That's not point of order, but it's now on the record. I call Bill Bowman. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. No one will argue that council tax is perfect. It is based on values almost 30 years old and does a poor job of actually funding councils. Yet the public are familiar with it and understand it. Any change must not add complexity, nor must change be used to slip in tax rises by the back door. That is the worry whenever we hear the Greens talk tax. Just this week, one of my constituents contacted me to express his fear that local tax reform of the sort proposed by the Greens could lead to him losing his home. It is a fear that is well-founded. The Greens re residential property tax would inflict back-breaking tax hikes on already hard-pressed households, almost half a billion pounds worth. Nearly 1.4 million homes, more than half of all Scottish properties, would be subject to the new tax burden. Mr Harvey has drawn a red line over this issue, threatening to withhold his blessing from the next budget unless his hard-left agenda is adopted. I don't have time. You've had your chance. Worrying, the SNP offer no assurance that they will not agree to send local tax bills skyrocketing. Mr Mackay has spoken of his commitment to making local taxation more progressive, and today's motion uses the very same term. Far from suggesting fairness, progressive has become a byword for an ideological obsession with raising taxes. If the SNP and the Greens are truly concerned with fairness, then they should accept that the simple fairness dictates that the government should not raise taxes on families working hard to pay their bills. Instead of propping up the lamentable left-wing consensus, Mr Mackay should heed the Scottish Conservatives and give councils more control over their budgets. Devolving business rates income would be both a serious revenue stream and transformational incentive to grow local tax bases. So to... Oh, well. <laughs> it was such a strange look you gave him, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. And presiding officer, um, just for clarity, local authorities do retain non-domestic rates. So is the position that local authorities should also set the poundage in local areas? Bill Bowman. No, not to set the rate. So to devolving LBTT revenues is just good common sense given the obvious connection between LBTT and both council tax and business rates. A new fiscal framework should be agreed to underpin such changes, one that recognises the needs of community and places localism at the heart of council funding. The Scottish Conservatives propose a mature and measured approach, one that gives councils more control and offers the public reassurance. Mr Mackay, please use this opportunity to give Scottish families that reassurance by ruling out any green grab on local taxes. I support the motion in the name of Murdo Fraser. Thank you very much. I call Mark Griffin to follow by Tom Arthur. Mr Griffin, please. Thank you, President Officer. And apologies to the Chamber and Mr Whiteman for missing the opening portion of his speech today. Um, but I do welcome the opportunity uh, to debate local taxation. Um, by design, the, the Labour and Green proposals do differ slightly, but the ambition to make property taxation more progressive is a shared one. Underlining our scheme is a plan to make 80% better off and put local government finance on a stable footing. Just as crucial as the policy intention to have a more progressive system is the symbolism to depart from a discredited Tory system introduced over a quarter of a century ago born out of the poll tax. That system has left the majority of householders in the wrong council tax band and has barely been tinkered with since it was devolved to this parliament. And that, that tinkering, increasing the multipliers of bands E to H, has raised a hundred million pounds on the back of those in the most expensive houses and most, most can afford it. But while the, the Scottish Government promise of a new exemption scheme for 54,000 low-income households so was meant to help cover these new costs, last month I discovered that fewer than 2,000 households have claimed. And we were told that a third of eligible householders are pensioners. And so there are thousands and thousands of older people still paying too much. 
what can only be described as a, a stick and plaster as, as part of a council tax reduction scheme that is itself only five years old and ripe for, for wholesale review. A like-for-like -like replacement of the council tax benefit by design, it has to compensate for the high costs of the regressive council tax. Presiding officer, in social security terms, we, we tackle the, the misery of poverty through boosting incomes in two ways, reducing high costs of annual bills and directly boosting the incomes of low-income families. A, a new, more progressive property tax would lower the bills for people in what we know as bands A and B, so boosting what are generally low incomes. And because uh, three quarters of the reduction is paid in bands A and B, the overall cost of a reduction scheme would fall to savings, which could be redirected to those who need it most. Today's scheme, um, costing £360 million, is paid to half a million Scots each year, although the number is now 11% lower than in 2013. And there is a £20 million underspend, but to date the government has no tracking system of who, who is missing out. Only a reform property tax and more attractive reduction scheme can adequately identify the households that need the most help. A new system which has impressive take-up rates run by Scottish Government and local authorities would deliver far better poverty relieving payments like free school meals or school clothing grants than the shambolic universal credit system. And, President Officer, while the Scottish Government approaches council tax reform with absolute trepidation, it seems, it's worthy of note that the finance secretary is less concerned tinkering with the reduction system for those on the lowest incomes every year. And with a, a promised discussion on the reduction scheme due this summer, perhaps the government would be wise to look at a wholesale redesign of council tax too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Griffin. I call Tom Arthur, followed by Tom Mason. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Andy Whiteman and the Scottish Greens for uh, bringing this debate to the Chamber. Um, and let me say, starting on a note of consensus, I have a great deal of respect for Mr Whiteman and his um, erudition on these matters. Um, and I was very interested to hear what the, the Green proposition was going to be because the motion makes reference to a, a cross-party implementation group, which rather presupposes that there is something to implement. However, Oh, certainly. Andy Whiteman. Uh, the implementation group is designed to scrap the council tax. Uh, the member will be well aware that there are different views across this parliament of what should replace it. There is in place a potential progressive majority for it. So the implementation group is merely to make the first start to commit to scrap the council tax. Tom Arthur. I thank um, Andy Whiteman for that intervention, but I'd actually be very keen to hear what the Green proposition is. And nine minutes and 11 se sessions. Well, I've not, had enough of props, even if they're green, they are not hold it up. In nine minutes and 11 seconds of Mr Whiteman um, moving the motion and in an intervention, he still hasn't outlined to the Chamber what his proposition is. And the reality is, with simply stating that they want to scrap the council tax, and let me say that Mr Whiteman very eloquently and convincingly outlined all of the flaws with the council tax system, and all of the errors with it and the unfairness. And I, I don't contest that. However, I do not think it would be correct to simply move and say we should abandon the council tax without something to replace it. And I think that is... A, yes. Yeah, would it, would it, would Mike it, Rumbles. Would it not concentrate the minds of the government if we were able to set a date in the future for the abolition of the council tax, wouldn't that concentrate minds? Tom Arthur. I think, Mike, most of our, I think setting an artificial deadline in that case could actually just lead to, to bad reform rather than the correct reform. Now, the reality is that I think there is consensus across the chamber that the council tax is not the most ideal form of local taxation. But I think rather than a cross-party implementation group, a cross-party discussion group, we can all be in situations, but the, the reality is if someone is in employment and they feel their job's unfair and decide to indulge in the moment and walk out of their job and hand in their notice, it might feel good at the time. But after that, I apologise, I've taken two already, Miss Bailey, otherwise I would have short for time. But if one just goes and leaves one's job and doesn't have another job to go to, one's going to face the consequences. The reality is, the reality is 
that there is clearly a desire amongst the progressive parties in this chamber to discuss about how we can make local taxation fairer. But I think that setting artificial deadlines, as Mr Rumble suggests, or indeed just scrapping it with a single idea about what we would want to replace it with would be a foolhardy measure. Well, I think what I would suggest is we begin a process of discussions, but in terms of my ideas, I think we should start with some basic principles. And the Cabinet Secretary made reference to the consultation document and income tax, and that outlined some key tests. Maintain and promote levels of public services. Lowest earners should not see rises. Any change should make the system more progressive, and changes should support the economy. Indeed, they could be buttressed further with the Adam Smith principles outlined in the consultation document of certainty, convenience, efficiency, and proportionality, and also a strong approach to make sure that it's a, a tax, that there's no tax avoidance, because as Murdo Fraser highlighted, uh, a property tax, and I think it was in a previous debate highlighted, is a very uh, important tax in the regards that it is very difficult to avoid paying council taxes. It potentially could be with some other taxes, such as a local income tax. I think with the broader thrust of where the Greens are going with this and where I am sympathetic is it needs to have a taxation system that addresses wealth, and that I do agree with. However, I think within the limited suite of powers we have within this parliament, for example, we don't have income tax power over savings and dividends. We don't have corporation tax. Um, so I think where there's a need for a much more broader suite of uh, uh, tax powers to implement the sort of taxes on wealth and those more progressive reforms that the Greens would like to see. There is much more I would say in this, presiding officer, but I realise time is against me. Thank you. Thank you very much. A call to Mason. Mr Mason, three minutes, please. Thank you. I remind colleagues that I'm an Aberdeen City Councillor still. Presiding officer, I've looked forward to this debate to make the case for a fairer funding for councils after government cuts. Because of the increasing block grant, council funding is down in real terms. It's unacceptable and has taken our public debate in the wrong direction. For all the talk of new solutions, the day hasn't been a discussion about the mechanisms we use to tax people. It's been a discussion about how to tax people more. Benjamin Franklin said in 1789, there remains two certainties, death and taxes. If we must have tax, we must choose them very wisely. I view tax in three criteria, fairness, effectiveness, and fitness for purpose. On fairness, ideally tax is set at a level seen as being levered equitably. When taxes are apportioned without equity, the result is discord. They also need to be transparent. On efficiency, rates that are cheap to collect and provide optimum tax taxation levels are the only sensible course. It's not financially neutral to take from customers and consumers and give to the beneficiaries. There's an economic impact. That's why it's important to consider side effects of these decisions and consider economic growth currently stagnating under the SNP. On fitness for purpose, tax exists to raise money for public services not to reorder society in a grand alternative universe the Greens would prefer. In the real world, it isn't appropriate to levy one increased tax upon another. And local taxation is a key element of this overall tax burden, because whilst tax, income tax rises discourage people from working here in Scotland, local tax raise, rises punish them for li actually living here. Whilst Mr Mackay will claim it's nothing to do with him, his decision to continue underfunding local government forced every council to increase town very quickly. Thank you. The member's actually in his final minute. I'm sorry, Mr. Mason, if you do it, you'll still have to conclude. Oh, very quickly, uh, today his <laughs> colleagues in the UK government increased local taxation by 5.1% in England. Does he share my hope that many people from England will come and relocate to Scotland at the lowest tax part of the UK? <laughs> Tom Mason. Uh, very unlikely. <laughs> We know every single occupancy household will face a high overall tax burden in 2018-19 than in 17-18. A 3% rise in the cheapest band A more than affects the maximum income tax reduction of 38 pence a week. In the written answer, Mr Mackay said he capped council taxes at 3% to, I quote, protect the household income. We know green proposals go well beyond 3%. So when the SNP craves to pass its next budget, it will by definition not be protecting household incomes. Scotland deserves better. It deserves a government that prioritises the high growth, low tax economy, boosting wages and creating jobs. And there you must conclude, Mr Mason. There you must conclude. Please sit down. I, I call on Willie Rennie, please, to close the Liberal Democrats four minutes.
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I don't know what's happened to Mike Rumbold. Uh, this afternoon, he agreed with Hamza Youssef on two separate occasions. And now he's been cheered on by Patrick Harvey. I think there must be something wrong with uh, Mike Rumbles this afternoon. Um, <laughs> yes, he, he won't be sacked, honestly, Murdo Fraser. Um, <laughs> we've, we've heard uh, this afternoon from Murdo Fraser and James Kelly, in fact, that the SNP have been on a journey with the council tax. There used to be a time that they would take every single opportunity to condemn it. Alex Salmon called it unfair and insisted he would scrap it. Then he didn't. Nicola Sturgeon said she hated it. Quite strong, she hated it. She went on to criticise any suggestion that it should be tinkered with. Then she did. Now the SNP seem to be the staunchest defenders of it. When they secured the support of the Greens and the Labour Party for their arbitrary increases to the council tax, I argued that it would not be the first steps towards further reforms, but it would be the last steps. I think now what we've heard from the Minister this afternoon is that we're going to have to get a consensus across the Parliament from the other parties before he'll even consider taking it forward. So rather than being with us on developing a consensus, he's going to be a bystander. And his long grass amendment this afternoon, I think, confirms that, yes. Let me be absolutely uh, clear. I have said that I'll work with any party to find a parliamentary majority, so it's not the case that I'll be a bystander. I clearly have a role as Finance Secretary, but to ask us to vote for a proposition to abolish a form of taxation without any idea of what replaces it is simply irresponsible. Willie Rennie. Well, that, that's a positive step forward because that's not what the position from the government was before. If they are prepared to take part in a constructive engagement about the replacement of the council tax, then I think that is a welcome development from the minister. Because this previous position was that they had delivered their manifesto commitment and they had no obligation to do anything else at all. So I think that's a welcome change. I also commend the Greens for trying again after they were convinced to back the government last time. Andy Whiteman used to make the case that the government last set of council tax changes violated international law. Not an argument I heard them make this afternoon. He cited Article 4, Article 9, Article 9.3 of the European Charter of Local Government. He made a convincing case that the government's council tax proposals were illegal before voting for those very same proposals. But I do hope and I do wish them well in changing the government's mind this time. They seem to be pretty determined to make sure they won't vote for the budget unless there are changes and we will be with them on that too. Now we favour the ending of the council tax. We think it's unfair. A land value tax is our alternative as it would levy a charge based on the real economic value of the land rather than just on the property of that land. It would be reflective of how well that land is serviced and what value it could deliver for the benefit of wider society. It is a strong set of lobbyists and enthusiasts who believe that this could be the best way of not just raising the revenue but shaping the way that our society and economy works in a fair and just way. If we are, however, to deliver change, it must be change that enhances local democracy. I was disappointed with the, the Minister's comments earlier on in favour of capping, because I think that undermines local democracy. The new local government tax must be a truly local tax set locally. That means leaving it to local authorities to set the rate that is right for them. And it must be a step towards allowing councils to raise the majority of the money that we spend. That is our proposal, and that's what we enter into this debate in a genuine and optimistic way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. I call on Jackie Bailey to close for Labour. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me also take you back to 2007. In the SNP manifesto, they said, and I quote, local taxes can be fairer, the SNP will scrap the council tax and introduce a fairer system based on ability to pay. No, you didn't take an intervention from me. I'm not taking one from you. Well, that was, of course, the first, the first of many broken promises to follow. The 2011 SNP manifesto promised to replace the council tax. Well, that went well, didn't it? Roll forward to 2016 and the promise to scrap the council tax had all but disappeared. Our history, our history is littered with quotes from John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon. 
Remember the discredited council tax or the unfair regressive council tax? No, you refuse to as well. Um, or my personal favourite, Labour's, Labour's hated council tax is totally unfair. And no, perhaps you should sit and listen to this. So I'll repeat it. And this, this, this is my personal favourite. Labour's hated council tax is totally unfair and any tinkering with bans would not make the system any fairer. Nicola Sturgeon, April 2007. What a delicious irony, presiding officer. Here are the SNP simply tinkering with the bans, keeping a hated and unfair council tax, exactly what the SNP said they were against. The council tax is regressive. The very poorest shoulder proportionately the larger burden. A decade on, and the SNP have not scrapped it, but we can. I must have done something wrong in a previous life, as I served on the Commission for Local Taxation together with Andy Whiteman. And let me say to Murdo Fraser, the Tories refused to participate. So asking parties about what they propose is just a tad cheeky even for you. But let me, let me say, let me say as well, we heard from experts, we heard from communities, we heard from professionals and elected members. There was data, there was modeling, everything you needed to know about local government finance and the options available to us were in the Commission's report. 19 recommendations, the very first of which was, and I quote, the present council tax system must end. Seven words, the shortest recommendation but the most powerful and the SNP can't bring themselves to implement the unanimous view of the Commission by scrapping the council tax. And a word to all these SNP members, including the Cabinet Secretary. The, committee, the Commission was chaired by a Scottish Government Minister. There was Labour representation, Liberal Democrat representation, the Greens and of course the SNP. They all agreed. They all agreed. Now, guess what? That makes a majority in this chamber. Are you saying? Are you saying that the SNP minister that was the chair got it entirely wrong? Is that the case? Because I think that is really... No, I'm not members taking in an intervention. The members in our last minute, sit listen. down, please. Um, presiding officer, there is a clear majority to replace the council tax. But let me also, in a 90-page report, of which there were several other volumes of evidence, remind the Cabinet Secretary that it said that this report serves to inform the design of alternatives. That's what the green motion is about. Let's have that discussion. Let's move it forward. We welcome the Greens motion. We will be supporting it. We have sympathy with the principle behind the Tory amendment, but they've clearly done a deal with the SNP to remove most of the green motion and stifle progress. And for that reason, we cannot support it. Presiding officer, the SNP have a choice a choice to reform local government funding, a choice to make it fairer for the people of Scotland. But I regret that they appear to be far too timid to even do so. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Stewart to close the Conservatives. Three minutes, Mr Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Greens say today's debate is about fairness. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Greens want to scrap the council tax, but that would mean hiking taxes for hard-working families. That would mean penalising aspiration. As Murdo Fraser has already said, they have no alternative and they have no idea. Bill Bowman talks about the tax being not perfect. Many people would support that. Over the past few months, it has become increasingly clear that the SNP, the Greens, Labour and the Liberal Democrats want to increase taxation. It is only the Scottish Conservatives who have the confidence to challenge this cosy consensus. But it's a fact uh, that we should, at this time, not be thinking about uh, dealing with uh, hiking any taxes. Uh, last year, the UK growth was 1.7% of the, the Scottish economy forecast. And that even with that, the 0.7%, the OECD has forecast that Scotland will have the lowest economic growth rate in the developed world for the next three years. Why would you want to put taxes up during that time space? There is, there is no doubt presiding officer, that there is an opportunity to take place to debate about local taxation. And it's clear that while there's a strong public awareness of the council tax, there is absolutely no doubt that there are flaws in the system uh, going back to 1991. 
At present, however, there is little public appetite to reform the council tax itself. That is perhaps why uh, the SNP have failed to deliver on their promises in their manifesto uh, and having been in government for the last 11 years. No, nope, time, is, time is very tight. Uh, there are nevertheless many ways that we could deal with trying to support uh, the taxation from councils. We in the Scottish Conservatives support widening the range of taxes that local authorities can use. There are, for example, strong cases for allowing councils to keep all their business rate and in income uh, and then to deal with that uh, and ensure that there's incentives throughout uh, the, uh, the location to, to inform and support. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, we on the Scottish Conservatives believe in empowering our local communities by devolving new financial powers to our councils to improve accountability and to drive growth locally. Today's call from the Greens for reform of local taxation is less about however, and it's more about trying to get tax rises through the back door. I therefore are very happy to support the addendum that the Scottish uh, Government's amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser and would encourage all of those across this chamber who believe in supporting hard-working families to do likewise because by doing that we may get a fairer system. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr Stewart and I call on Derek Mackay to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Five minutes please. Thank you Presiding Officer. I'll need to check the official report but Alexander Stewart referred to introducing new local taxes and I'm genuinely interested what the Tory secret plan for those new local taxes are genuinely interested actually because I think every party has suggested that there is potential in local discretion in this area so there is there is a bit of consensus from every single party in the chamber which is why I am not walking away uh, Willie Rennie I do believe that we can find consensus I just spend a moment sorry uh, I miss how much time I've got I'm sure it'd be very generous five minutes um, so I'd be very, very, very interested in that. But do you know, as well as the parliamentary party in here, I think this is a serious point. Yes, there was the Commission on Taxation, but subsequent to that, there's also been parliamentary elections and arguably even more important local government elections as well. And I do think it would be fair, at the very least, to engage with COSLA on what they think about local taxation going forward because elections are indeed important and the Tories have asked what are we doing are we delivering on our promises I was elected on the 2016 Scottish Parliament manifesto that set out what we would do in council tax and that is exactly what we've done in terms of our proposition and all my colleagues in the SNP are in the same position in that regard but again I recognize we are in the parliament of minorities and do need to reach a consensus with others and my door remains open to discuss that but I do think it's unreasonable to set out to say that we will scrap the council tax without an alternative. We do need to test many of the issues in, in relation to local taxation. Now, I suppose the, the Scotland team being in Australia at the moment, the Commonwealth Games team, I suppose we'll be proud of the parliamentarians in terms of the policy somersaults that have gone on. If we want to date back to 2007, where was every other political party's position in relation to local taxation at that point? We committed to consult in 2011, we've done that. We committed in 2016 to reforms that we've delivered, which puts in an extra half a billion pounds to Scotland's uh, public services. And I think it is significant to say just for a moment that local government has had a very fair settlement from the Scottish government. Yes, in part because of the constructive approach from the Greens, and I acknowledge and I accept that. I mean, in terms of the Tories, it was almost laughable. I, mean, I understand the position, the pragmatic position, but it is in Tory-run England that council tax rises are above 5%, so it does seem a bit rich to criticise the, the Scottish Government, of course, making England the highest tax part of the United Kingdom, opposing, opposing rate capping despite it being in the Tory manifesto and trying to take credit for the changes to the multipliers which the Tories actually voted against when push came to shove. So we will take forward a tax debate because it's really important that local government has continuity of funding, security eh, of funding to deliver for public services across Scotland. And local authorities do have that deg degree of discretion in which we said we'll look further at. Do not dismiss uh, the serious governance review that we are undertaking in partnership with local government COSLA 
the work around land value tax, the work around further local discretion, the work around further local and community empowerment, and the, the commitment I've given previously, and I restate, around ensuring that we could deliver a more progressive system. But that is essentially the offer I've made to the opposition political parties, but in a reasonable, fair, evidence-based and pragmatic way. That is a reasonable and fair approach that gives certainty to local authorities in planning out their resources, but also acknowledging the difficulties in any alternative to look at what further refinement that we can make. And I think it is a serious uh, proposition that we are putting forward to engage with the other parties over a period of time, uh, but in a fashion that can strike consensus, recognising that we have to find a balance. And of course, we will respect um, Parliament and the Parliament's position uh, in that um, regard. In terms of ongoing uh, financial outlook for uh, local government, I'll continue to work in partnership with them to give them the best possible settlement that we can to look at see how we can empower them to make more decisions at a more local level. But that's all the more reason to engage in the reviews that are underway, not to walk away from them. And it is in that spirit of consensus and positivity on a constructive uh, approach to ensure that if we refine the system further, we can do it in a fashion that commands confidence, I believe, in the way that we did around the engagement and in income tax. This no, you must conclude, Cabinet Secretary. Finally, Thank you. Officer, we have delivered on our manifesto commitment and we'll keep on. I call Patrick Harvey to close for the Greens till five o'clock, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the, the members who have taken part in this debate, but I really must begin by expressing my frustration that here we are, nearly 20 years after devolution began, still trying to break this logjam. And in the knowledge uh, Mr. Arthur, that uh, every aspect of local taxation, taxation for local services of any form we wish, has been within the devolved competence of this parliament from day one. Now, look, nobody, I'm pleased to say, has really been in this debate defending the council tax on its own merits. Tom Arthur. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. If, for example, there was to be a local income tax administered, does he believe that should include savings and dividends, which we don't have the power for in this parliament? Patrick Harvey. We don't have the power uh, on that, and I don't support a local income tax. I'll come on to that later. Nobody here has been really defending council tax on its own terms, and that is understandable because it is a fundamentally broken system. Regressive, still regressive after the, the most recent tweaks, uh, 25 years plus out of date, and in which most households, most properties are in the wrong band. How absurd to continue with a system of taxation we, where we know most people are paying the wrong amount. I welcome the, the case that's been made by uh, a number of members, James Kelly and others, uh, that this long-standing argument needs to be addressed, but also that there is a need for wider reform of local, ta local uh, council services and new fiscal, fiscal powers, the flexibility that could offer. There does need to be that, that wider reform and it needs to include asset wealth in the form of property as part of the tax base. There seems to be a consensus still on that. And the, uh, the argument uh, there is one, uh, bizarrely, where I agree with, with Murdo Fraser. Absolutely, property wealth uh, needs to be part of that. And in relation to the earlier arguments on local income tax, I was never convinced that that was the right option. But clearly, even its advocates must see that in the case, in the context now of devolved power on national income taxes, the case for an additional local income tax is messier and less necessary. Look, there, there have been some uh, un, uh, unwelcome comments that I do need to draw attention to. The idea that we're pretending there's no alternative. Look, the Green Proposal is not a prop, merely a document to refer to, we published over two years ago. Other parties have their own proposals as well. We know, though, that consensus needs to be built. We're not insisting here in this debate that other parties just adopt our policies wholesale. We're only recommending that we endorse recommendation one of the Commission report, council tax has to go, and then begin to build the consensus. Derek, Derek Mackay claims that he's addressed the unfairness of the council tax uh, and he cites the Resolution Foundation, uh, but they've been very clear the SNP's tax increase would raise revenue in a progressive manner. They have not said that the resultant tax 
as amended, is a progressive tax. And of course, it absolutely isn't. I'll give away one more time. Mike would, Rumbles. Would Patrick Harvey agree with me that if the Scottish Government set a date years in advance for the abolition of the council tax, it would concentrate demands and we get to achieve something? Patrick Absolutely. We, we seek an implementation group. If the government wants to call it something else, fine, call it something else. But it needs to be about cracking on with the job and making progress. That would begin to uh, see the, the prospect of legislation during this term of the parliament. We've suggested a, a five-year transition period to any new system. So we're talking about a long-term argument here. But you don't make progress on a long-term argument unless you take the first steps. Um, the, the idea... Uh, that there is no majority for a specific replacement. That presiding officer is for one reason only. It is because we have tolerated an unjust status quo for so long. That is our collective failure over years as a parliament across the political spectrum. But it now seems during this debate that there is a measure of consensus emerging. There have been comments from Greens, from Labour, from Lib Dems, from some in the SNP, and I know that there are some even in the Tories, for example, who have made the case for a broader range of tax measures at local level, and some who support the case for a land value tax, who do not echo uh, the, the nonsensical rhetoric of a garden tax, as if Murdo Fraser actually imagines that gardens aren't already counted in the valuation of properties as they stand. The problem is they're counted in a, a valuation scheme which is out of date, broken and in which most households are in the wrong band. <laughs> Presiding officer, there's a great deal more that I would like to say. I hope that we have many more chances to progress this debate further because it needs to be progressed. I believe that the range of options is out there. The argument that we've addressed the fundamental unfairness of the council tax is spurious and we need to crack on and get this job done. People in Scotland have been voting for political parties saying they want to scrap the council tax for donkey's years. Let's all now commit. There is a measure of consensus which we can reach, and if we agree that we're going to pass legislation during this parliament, we will have done something that is not only economically sensible, but socially just as well. I commend the motion in Andy Whiteman's name. Thank you very much, and that concludes our debate on Scrap the Council Tax. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11339 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Uh, I would ask any member who objects, uh, who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 11339. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 11339 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the bureau, to move motion 11340 on approval of an SSI and motion 11341 on designation of a lead committee? Moved together. Thank you very much. Now, we turn now to decision time, and there are ten questions this evening. I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Hamza Youssef is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Jamie Green and Colin Smith would fall. So the first question is that amendment 11289.2 in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend motion 11289 in the name of John Finney on better buses, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Or not agreed? We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11289.2 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 63, no 51. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. So two of the amendments are preempted. And the next question is that motion 11289 in the name of John Finney as amended on better buses be agreed. Are we all agreed? Is there a no there? No. <laughs> 
There was a no there, yes. Yes, in that case, we shall move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 11289 in the name of John Finney as amended is yes 109, no 0. There were five abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 11290.2.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend amendment number 11290.2 in the name of Derek Mackay on scrap the council tax be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11290.2.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes 28, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amend amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 11290.2 in the name of Derek Mackay, who seeks to amend motion 11290 in the name of Andy Whiteman on scrap the council tax, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11290.2 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 86, no 28. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 11290.1 in the name of James Kelly, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Andy Whiteman on the council tax be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of James Kelly is yes, 23, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 11290 in the name of Andy Whiteman as amended on scrap the council tax be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 11290 in the name of Andy Whiteman, as amended, is yes, 86, no, 28. There were no abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 11340 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on, a, on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And the final question is that motion 11341 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Graham Day on Earth Hour. And we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to take their seats or to change seats. Thank you.